So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, thank you. Good to see everybody. Um, welcome again to uh, Roosevelt House. Welcome to um, another student brown bag, a panel discussion. We have a really great, lively discussion today, so I'm excited about it. Before I go any further, um, I'd like to just acknowledge and thank the leadership of President Rabb, Harold Holzer, who's the director of, the, uh, of this institute. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my team in the public policy program. Uh, Alexis, who runs JFU, is Alexis here? Where is she? Oh, she's up top. Um, Bianca, who runs the public policy scholars. Thank you, Bianca. Um, Peter, who is our program, who one of our program directors here, who a lot of the students I know I've talked to and worked with in the past. Danny, Phil, and um, Aaron, thank you all for your leadership. And um, thank my capstone class. So my capstone class is here. Good to see you all. Um, just had you. Hope I didn't bore you for two hours before we got here. So thank you. Um, we have this great panel today, and I'm really excited. We, we did a similar panel last semester where we brought in some writers to talk, political writers, to talk about what was going on in the city. I thought it was appropriate that even though we have so much going on in the world, when you think about the Ukraine, when you think about um, a Supreme Court, uh, confirma uh, uh, confirmation hearings for a Supreme Court nominee. Um, there's still a state budget being negotiated. And I thought, bless you, it was important that we take a little time to talk about what's happening at the state level, how it may impact where, wherever you are in the state and the city of New York. So joining me today from my far left is Rebecca Lewis. Rebecca is deputy state politics reporter for City and State the weekly magazine and website focused on all things political in New York City and Albany. Before joining City and State more than four years ago, Rebecca worked for the public radio station WFUV. Where is that? Fordham you are a graduate of Fordham University. Yeah, outstanding. That's outstanding. In a variety of roles, including reporter, anchor, and podcast producer. A native New Yorker, she said she graduated from Fordham University with a degree in communications and can be found on Twitter at underscore Rebecca two C's. Yes. Oh no, Rebecca two C's, then the one C. Oh, my bad. <laughs> R, so let me spell that, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-C -C -C Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. Um, next is Ben Max to my immediate left. He's the executive editor of Gotham Gazette, an independent news publication of Citizens Union Foundation that closely covers New York government and politics. He is also the host of the Max Politics podcast. Before shifting to journalism in 2012, Ben worked in education for, for 10 years, most of them as a high school history teacher. He grew up in Queens, lives in Brooklyn, and he's on Twitter at, at TweetBenMax. My, my mother was a special ed teacher in Queens for almost 30 years. Um, she has some wonderful stories, so teachers always get, get an extra shout out. Um, and in the middle, um, lastly, Laura Namias, all right, is a senior reporter covering city and state politics for Bloomberg News. Before joining Bloomberg, she wrote political features for New York Magazine and served for two years as a member of the Daily News editorial board. She's worked as a political reporter covering both Albany and City Hall for Politico where she also wrote the New York Playbook. Laura has a master's degree in journalism from Columbia and graduated with a degree in history from Wesleyan University, and she is a native of Memphis, Tennessee. All right, how do we find you on Twitter? Uh, at Namias. N-A-H-M-I-A-S. All right, let's get right into it. If I can ask you, starting with Ben on my left, what are your big takeaways from what's happening in Albany right now with respect to the budget? Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thank you all for being here. Um, I think one of the most important things, at least in this conversation, is just to stress at the beginning how important the New York State budget is. Uh, it's just whether it's about the amount of policy that often gets baked into the final deal or just the spending, this budget's going to be roughly $220 billion. It's just immensely important to services that New Yorkers get or have access to or don't have access to and where that money is going. And, uh, and this is, you know, just happening uh, in Albany or these days, you know, a lot by Zoom and, and sort of 
out of the public eye often, and it's just extremely important. And other than that, I'll say that $220 billion, New York has a ton of money, and sort of miraculously, although people might take issue with that because there were decisions made to make it such, uh, coming out of the pandemic, the state has all the money basically that it could need or ask for to fund many, many things. There's always more need or more things that people are pushing for funding for, but the state is flush with cash, cash thanks to the federal government and, and higher than expected tax receipts. And there are um, just, and we'll get into the specifics, many different things being debated, whether it's childcare or CUNY, SUNY, and so forth. And it's really just about how many hundreds of millions or how many billions are gonna be put towards these um, these priorities. Laura. Yeah, um, I think just to echo what Ben said, this is, um, I think Bloomberg wrote something relatively recently um, about the fact that this is the first five-year state financial plan in history that didn't have a deficit in it. And it's hard to, um, hard to overstate how strange that is, that we're not operating from an environment of scarcity at the moment. Um, still, like, an embarrassment of riches doesn't mean that you don't have any problems figuring out how to spend it. And also, I'm, as I'm sure all of you are aware, there's an extraordinary amount of need um, on so many different levels uh, because of the lingering effects of the pandemic and, and everything that came before it. Um, and the only other point I, I would make is that um, it's been interesting to observe this year with a new governor for the first time in a decade that some of the dynamics don't change, even though the person does. Uh, the governor has an extraordinary amount of power in the budget process, um, due in part to a, a really important court decision that, that maybe you guys are aware of, uh, Silver v. Pataki. Um, and uh, uh, she, she really has a, a tremendous amount of authority and, and we're seeing um, some efforts by state lawmakers to try and, and push back on that for the first time in a long time right. this year. I wanna come to a point about that in a second. Uh, well, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so obviously echo the same things uh, about the enormity of the state budget and its importance uh, and just about the, the fact that we have a new governor who seems to still be operating at least some ways similar, some ways uh, different uh, in that it's an incredibly opaque process and that hasn't changed, uh, especially now with our new governor who has sort of taken a stance against uh, public policy positions, uh, makes it even harder to know what's going on. Uh, traditionally, it's been called three men in a room. It's now two women and one man in a room, but that hasn't changed. A uh, good government advocate recently described it to me as muscle memory in Albany. Uh, so. Uh, again, it's it's last year was an extraordinary budget process. Uh, a governor engulfed in scandal uh, and empowered uh, super majorities in both chambers and uh, new taxes, record high spending, and the legislature is emboldened once again to uh, see what they can do during this bu budget process with a new governor seeking her first election to a full term. And uh, it's it's been a very interesting process and seeing how it will play out, uh, especially as uh, ben said, uh, we're flush with cash, uh, both recurring and one time from the federal government, and uh, the fights on how to spend that exactly are you know, really heating up right now. Thank you for using the terms recurring and one time because my capstone class, we just talked about that today uh, the last two weeks, so thank you. I actually wanna focus on this, this, this dynamic between a new governor who is up for re-election, who is up for her first, uh, her election to her first full term, um, and a legislature that seems to be more progressive than the past. Um, what what's the dynamic like? It's got I know it's a different dynamic than than when Andrew Cuomo was governor. Uh, but do you get the sense? And uh, any of you can answer. Do you get the sense that there is more? Does the governor have a lot of political capital? Is there more willingness by Carl Heasty, uh, the the speaker, uh, and Andrew Stewart Cousins, Cousins, the majority leader, to want to work with this governor, or are they still sort of solid in their positions from the past? Anybody? Uh, I I think there is undoubtedly uh, a new atmosphere of collaboration that there hasn't been in the past. There's no question that. Governor Hochul came in promising to do business differently than former Governor Cuomo. 
Um, I don't think anybody could could really emulate his his style and tactics, uh, and and most people did not want the new governor to. Uh, and so I think there's been a bit of that, but I also think there's been a lot that is remarkably similar to the past, including uh, how the public I and is not being let into a lot of the final negotiations, and especially on things like this criminal justice uh, plan that the governor has that she won't talk about publicly that relates to bail reform and raise the age and a number of other things. Um, but I do think there is more an atmosphere of collaboration, but push comes to shove, there's always issues where there's divergence, and we can see that comparing the governor's executive budget to the one house budget resolutions that each of the majorities put forward, including things like how much money will go towards expanding childcare, how much money will go towards a variety of other pr uh, priorities like uh, rental assistance um, and so forth. And so there's a few issues that they disagree on seemingly, including what to do about bail and some other things, but mostly they agree on a lot and there's the money to do it. It's just going to be about, you know, the end compromises. But I, I do think there's a little bit of tension on a few items. Yeah, I think um, one thing that I am interested in watching and I don't know what the, the answer is going to be is that Hochul faces uh, this primary election, Democratic primary election at the end of June. Um, and I think arguably her strongest challenge right now is coming from her right flank, not from her left. Um, and we're seeing things like some very high profile headlines about you know, rising categories of certain crimes in New York City that puts a lot of pressure on her, rising inflation. Those are things that when combined can hurt Democrats at the polls. Um, whether or not like sh she's in between a rock and a hard place, she's, she has to win first the Democratic primary and then she has to win a general election in November. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not the state legislature gives her a win that allows her to say in this budget or even by the end of session that she did something about crime or something to help lower and, and middle class um, New York residents. Uh, I, I don't know if it would necessarily be all of the different things that she pushed for in her uh, bail reform proposal, but if they can come out and say that they're doing something to tackle it, are they giving her cover for um, the challenges that she's facing both in the Democratic primary and the general uh, from people who are even more centrist or right than, than she is? Um, yeah, you know, when she first came into office, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a Democratic lawmaker uh, who had something overly negative to say about her uh, in that they were saying already there's a tone shift. We appreciate that. She's going to be more collaborative. We, we look forward to working with her. Um, it was overall a very positive reception, but she took office, uh, you know, halfway through the year after the legislative session. Uh, you know, it was a six-month honeymoon period for her. Uh, and this budget is really the first time that we're seeing her interact with the legislature in a really meaningful way. And we're starting to see some of those tensions in the way that they're negotiating in, you know, how she's unveiling policy, certainly to the point of bail, uh, having her proposal leak to the press, uh, regardless of how it got out there, um, certainly has uh, not had the best impression on key lawmakers who are important in the go negotiating process who have said that this is the first time they're seeing this proposal. Um, so, you know, it, she's still a new governor, she's still new to the position, uh, and, you know, it's potentially seeing some missteps that could hurt her, but as Ben said, there is still uh, the vast majority of things she and lawmakers agree on. It's just uh, sort of a matter of measures. Uh, but in the end, uh, the small things can make the biggest difference. So uh, I agree with Laura that uh, seeing to what degree lawmakers will give her cover uh, for the upcoming election will actually pan out or if they will be closing in on their own ranks to make sure that they're providing coverage cover to any vulnerable uh, legislators in their own ranks. So let's pick up from there because you mentioned the challenge from the right. Um, so bail reform, it does, with bail reform, it does seem like some of the dynamics shifted because of the concerns around 
Um, why are you trying to? Why are you trying to make changes? How are you doing this? The, the fact that it you know leaked to the press. So uh, I'd actually ask all of you to talk about two things. One, um, what does it mean that it leaked to the press, and what? How does that? How does that? How does that feel if you're a lawmaker? Why would the governor want to do that if she actually did do that? And two, um, you know, wh what what is changing? What wh why why this? Why now? I think I, I, I wonder. I, I I'm curious to know what you think because I actually don't know the answer. People are of two minds on this. This is how things go in Albany. Um, did she leak it herself? so that she can, or did someone in her office leak it, um, so that it looks like she at least tried to get something on bail reform, and then she's assuming it'll be a flop, but she can point to the fact that she tried? Or did someone else, um, not from her office, leak it to embarrass her and to prevent it from, so much of the budget gets done behind closed doors and then the bills get printed right before the budget gets voted on and nobody knows what's in it, even the people voting on Is it. Is that real? Nobody knows what's in it? Because we heard that with, we hear that with the Affordable Care Act that people voted on it, didn't know what was in it. Is that a real thing? It happens every year. They print the <laughs> budget bills and, and uh, the lawmakers are still reading them when they're voting on them. Just and it's a insane. Really quick aside and then I'll let you go. A prominent example of that recently was um, uh, a, a clause buried in one of the budget bills that gave immunity to nursing home and hospital operators during the pandemic. Uh, most lawmakers had no idea who was in there until a reporter, I believe from the New York Times, I think was the first to report on that, contacted them and they realized what was in the fine print. So uh, we're talking thousands of pages of bills and nothing is in the places it's supposed to be. Uh, so yes, to just to give an example of how that does happen in Albany, but continue. Did you yeah, no, yeah, I, I just I, it, either way, I don't know what exactly happened with that bail reform proposal coming out, but um, somebody's benefiting from it. We don't know who it is. I could absolutely be wrong here, and and this is you know partly counterintuitive, and you'd be the expert more on this, but um, you know some of the some of the Democrats and even a couple of Republicans that I've spoken with basically argue that Republicans have already won the bail, the political argument on bail. The, there were no Democratic uh, leaders who really stood up for it and made a convincing argument. Carl Hasty does not like talking to the media. It, it would really have fallen on him, but he doesn't want to do that. Uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio didn't really like the compromise. He's argued for different things that are much closer to what Mayor Adams is arguing for. Uh, Governor Cuomo, you know, was always uncomfortable with some of these criminal justice reforms, even though he touted them. There was nobody to really own it, uh, other than, you know, maybe some of the people further to the left, but not the most prominent voices. And so Democrats right now are basically just like, playing on Republican turf. They were, they, right from the beginning on bail, they were sort of owning the messaging on this. Even if there's tweaks made this year, the, the narrative in the election is going to be the same. If Governor Hochul says to voters, oh, but we, we tweaked it again, we made some changes, I don't, I just, I don't see that mattering very much. So to me, uh, so much of this is uh, Democrats having differences of opinion on the issue and nobody really defending it and nobody really doing doing anything particularly well on this and playing on the sort of messaging turf of Republicans who are are sort of owning this issue. Yeah, no, I think about this a lot because on the one hand, I remember um, after George Floyd, I did a, a panel discussion and I was, I was interviewing Jim Clyburn, Senator, uh, Congress Member Clyburn of South Carolina. And he made this comment, and he made it publicly several times and then talked about it during the panel. He said that the defund was, w we we're going to lose on defund. And he said, it's not the issue, it's the wording. S plain and simple, it's the wording. We can do a lot around defunding police in, in, in terms of reforming police, but the wording is going to cost us. And he was, he was absolutely right in the sense that if you listen to the Supreme Court uh, hearings yesterday, and prior to that, the tee up to the hearing was, oh, she's a, she's a defense attorney, she's a public defender, 
oh, she must be soft on crime. I mean, it is not, all of this is connected, right? It is not, this isn't happening in silos. And so to all of your points, I think in many ways, the, I don't wanna say that the Democrats have been on the defensive, but in a way, we've, it, Democrats have had to defend, defund. And we always say in campaigns, if you're explaining, you're losing. And, and that, I think, is, is part of this dynamic that's happening at the, at the state level. Um, but I also think, a couple of days earlier, um, which we'll talk about in a second, Andrew Cuomo puts out this, goes to a black church and, <laughs> and, uh, and talks about, uh, you know, bail reform, or, or he went to the, um, the Latino clergy in the Bronx to talk. And, and I think there's a reaction to that as well, as part of it. Did you want to say something? I was just going to say, um, to your point, is, uh, you know, just a personal observation of, you know, covering politics, observing pos politics, is just the fact that, uh, and this is true at the state level as well, is uh, Democrats historically have a, a branding problem mm. that Republicans don't have. Uh, and when it comes to controversial issues like this, like bail reform, like defund, uh, the Republican Party has been able to close ranks better and uh, unify around a message. Whether or not facts support it uh, in the issue of bail reform, the, there's no data to suggest one way or the other currently, whether it's a success or a failure. There's some data, and we have been able to analyze it, but there's very little historical context. Either side can use it to make their point, but uh, uh, to Basil's point, uh, Democrats are very often on the defensive as they are right now about bail reform, and it's, it's a national issue, it's a local issue, it's a hyper-local issue, uh, especially uh, if anyone was paying attention to the elections that happened last, last year uh, across the state, uh, Republicans uh, won in big ways uh, by campaigning on crime and bail reform even in uh, literally the safest county in the United States, Nassau, which for two years running has been ranked the safest county in America. Uh, still, they were able to uh, pull out victories on this messaging of law and order, crime is increasing, bail reform is a failure, and there's fear among Democrats and there's a hope among Republicans that they can do that again in well, this year. I would just very quickly say um, that along with the governor's view of a statewide election, in the New York State Senate, even though they have a very comfortable supermajority, there is the question about whether they might lose seats in the state Senate. The assembly is, is pretty much a foregone conclusion. There could be one or two seats that Republicans pick up, but the state Senate, which was in Republican hands before 2019 via the 2018 elections, uh, you know, could be a place where Republicans pick up a few seats and, and then you get again more, more of this uh, narrative and, uh, and questions around this. So I think behind the scenes, one of the things that's happening is moderate to conservative Democrats are concerned about losing their seats in some of these um, suburban and other, other areas. Well, and I think there's, it, it's really unfortunate, I think, to the extent that there's good faith discussions happening around this, um, a lot of these criminal justice reform changes uh, took effect in 2019 and, and many different variables were tweaked. Um, and then the world collapsed um, very shortly thereafter and even more variables changed. And so you hear people and, and you know, to the extent that I'm an optimistic person, which I, I maybe I'm not, but I'm trying to be better about it. Um, I, you hear politicians wondering and talking about what exactly is causing certain categories of crime to increase. And the thing is, and historically, they really don't know the answer. And they're trying to figure it out by isolating certain variables, and, but they don't wanna infringe on people's civil liberties at the same time. And it is like a tortured discussion. They don't wanna lose their places of power to be the policy makers and decision makers. Um, because they made the wrong decision, but they don't know what the right thing to do is, and, and they don't have a great answer for what exactly is causing some of the crime increases. Um, and and it's, it's sort of, it's unfortunate from a policy perspective um, that all of this happened all together and they don't know which variable caused what. Um, just again, thank you so much for echoing things that I've talked about in my class, variables. Independent, independent, right? And when is it a good time to evaluate your policies, right? How do you implement them? 
So I'm sorry. Speaking of evaluating, yeah. there's been no hearing on bail reform yeah. at the state level. Yeah. It's yeah. unimaginable to me how state government in this state works, even now with new leaders and you know people who've been put away for corruption from both parties or people who've resigned or all the promises. The ways that some things are still uh, business as usual. In New York City, there's lots of problems, but some of these processes, there would never, they would never go this long without an oversight hearing at the city council on, on something like this. And, and is, it, is it because there's, a, there's this sentiment that we need this to work, so let's just not talk about it openly? Or you know, what is, what's, the, what's the rationale behind that? How did we get to that point? Well, uh, how long did the legislature go without having a uh, hearing about sexual harassment? Yeah. Yeah. 30 years? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of business as usual, uh, and it's hard to get out of the rut, uh, even with new leadership. And, you know, dysfunction is uh, endemic to Albany. Uh, if there are any Hamilton fans out there, uh, even in Hamilton, there is a line about nowhere is as dysfunctional as Albany. Uh, I know I'm paraphrasing, but uh, <laughs> even back then, it's it's been like that forever. So it's why it's really hard to say, uh, but it's it's kind of always been that way. Yeah. Now, we I'm going to turn it over to the audience for questions shortly, but I want to get to two very quick things. Um, we haven't talked about him, but um, we, we also have a new mayor. How's he, how's he, how is he in this process? Uh, is he... Uh, does he look like he's going to get what he wants from Albany? How's he been faring? I, it actually is remarkable to me, having covered um, uh, Mayor de Blasio's interactions with Albany um, starting early in his term. I think Eric Adams is actually, um, from my observation, making some of the similar, what I think people would argue were missteps in the way that he interacted with. Similar missteps. Similar missteps. Um, what I mean specifically is that de Blasio um, would sort of like, like a baseball player, sort of like point for the fences and say he was going to hit the ball there or something before he'd ever announced or, or had any meetings, you, you need to, um, in order for things to function, you have to have, inform all of the stakeholders in advance of what your intentions are and bring them on board beforehand um, and, and not say that you're gonna achieve some policy and take people's votes or support for granted just because they're members of the same party or come from the same neighborhood. And Eric Adams um, has been criticized, if I'm remembering correctly, um, by some of the, the members of the state legislature for staking out claims of what he wants on, on bail reform or uh, changes to raise the age um, without seeking support from the state lawmakers in advance of, of rolling out that agenda, which is, and they are annoyed by that. It's all the more remarkable for the fact that he was himself a state lawmaker. <laughs> Um, maybe it's something about living at Gracie Mansion. I don't know. Uh, it's just an I very interesting. I, th I think you actually, that, that's right. It's about people's, you know, at least these two last mayors that I've, you know, also covered this, this overinflated sense of, of what your win means. And, you know, they're, they're, they're clearly, if you want, you know, and I encourage anybody who's interested to go find the video, you know, the mayor testified before the, the state legislature on, on the governor's budget and his Albany priorities. And it was fascinating. There was a sense of, um, you know, uh, a honeymoon in many ways, but also a remarkable number of legislators who really pushed back on him uh, from the same party. I, and he, he wound up getting a lot more compliments from Republicans in the hearing around criminal justice policies. And, and you know, that shows his, his mixed philosophy and, and agenda. In terms of what he wants, there's the criminal justice reforms, the legislative leaders indicate they don't want to move on those, but now the governor's into the mix with alignment with him, more or less, so that could get very interesting in the final deal. One of the other big things at play is mayoral control of New York City schools. To Laura's point, the governor had put in a four-year extension in her budget, which is a big, you know, sort of olive branch gift to him. The two houses of the legislature did not put any extension in their budget resolutions. Now, this doesn't have to be dealt with until June, but to me, that was like a shot across the bow at him for how he handled the relationships. Uh, and, and that is not a, a good sign. 
below those two things, there's a whole bunch of other things that he wants, the city wants, some interesting stuff on childcare, on the in earned income tax credit, mental health policy, and so forth. And I think he'll probably get a lot of, of that stuff. Um, I think uh, what's, what's kind of interesting is the, there is an expectation that since he is a former state lawmaker that he would have a really good relationship with the legislature. He knows how the budget process works. He knows how legislators think. Um, and you know, early in his tenure, uh, people were saying, lawmakers up in Albany were saying, we haven't seen him up here. He hasn't come. Uh, you know, when he provided his, his testimony on the budget on, you know, what's called Tin Cup Day, when all the local uh, executives come up and they, <laughs> they shake asking their cups for asking for money, um, is usually, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, you know, people are around, they try to catch lawmakers in between their, uh, their testimony. Uh, Mayor Adams did, did this virtually. And of course, he still laid out his priorities. Lawmakers still grilled him and, or applauded him, depending on their stances. Uh, but his physical absence from Albany uh, was somewhat telling, and also, you know, it's not a huge deal, but to lawmakers to have a sense that he doesn't care enough to make the trip, to put in the appearance, to, you know, take that Amtrak up to, to Albany, which he did do, um, you know, notably tweeting about, you know, his seat in Hudson River side or right. ugly side. <laughs> Um, but, you know, that initial uh, snub, I suppose, uh, has certainly not done him any favors in his relationship with a much more progressive legislature. Now, the one person we did touch on a little bit, but we can't talk about the state without talking about him, I guess, and I guess that's the point, um, is Andrew Cuomo. Um, what's going on? Is he running? Is he not running? He's talking about another, uh, another, uh, establishing another party, and he already established another a party that, uh, what is the Women's Equality Party, right? And now uh, defunct. And now women's defunct Women's Equality, equality Party, <laughs> um, which I look at the irony of that um, at this point. But the, the and I know you don't have a definitive answer, but w what is it looking like? You you know his psychology as well as as we do, I think. Um, he's a, he his mind is very interesting to me, <laughs> but he is a cautious person. Um, you might not assume that necessarily, um, but he has always governed by poll, and um, and he doesn't like to be humiliated or lose, and I don't think that he would run for something if he wasn't certain that he would win. Um, and he only has a few weeks left to gather enough petitions to run as a Democrat. He has a longer amount of time if he wanted to mount a, a third party candidacy. But I think it, it for him, there's this internal battle between his need to continue to be part of the political conversation that he feels like he had to leave too soon um, and also this desire to just not be humiliated uh, by running for something and then losing. So it, it seems like the odds would tip toward he'll stay in the race as, or in the will he or won't he race as long as he can. Um, uh, his father famously dithered on whether or not to accept a Supreme Court nomination and was dubbed Hamlet on the Hudson. And I think the son is following in the father's footsteps um, and maybe we'll just see him play it out as long as possible. And I know I, I certainly want you two to respond, but uh, if you can also, in your response, also you know address to, to the extent that you can. Now, what does this do? Because we have Jamani Williams in the race, uh, right? And there is, you know, he's clearly taking a progressive lane. And is this moving? Uh, is this is his flirtation pulling Kathy Hochul to the right? Um, and by the way, we also have Tom Swazi in the race, who was running already running to her right. So how does it how does it change the, the their dynamic as well? Uh, well, what's interesting about Tom Swazi is um, he will he's repeatedly um, not come to Cuomo's defense, but will say he's this guy's got the right ideas. What he's saying is right. He did some good stuff as governor. So it's actually um, you know he's been kind of 
using this to his own advantage to say, yeah, he's right. We can't, you know, give into cancel culture. We can't, you know, just have criminals rum running rampant. rampant. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, one might think that try associating yourself with uh, someone like Andrew Cuomo at this point in time would be uh, not a good strategy, uh, but he keeps doing it. So it, there must be internal polling that shows that it's playing well. Now, if Cuomo enters the race, I'm sure that he will reg re regret um, kind of any praise, even lukewarm, that he gave uh, up until this point. Um, but it's 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 very interesting, and just to the point of will he won't won't he? Uh, another thing important to consider is because his mind is an enigma is what would be victory for him. He is, you know, nothing if not vindictive. And uh, victory for him could just potentially be playing a spoiler. You know, it's, it, it's unlikely given that it requires him to publicly lose an election, but he was forced out of government. He feels he was forced out of government unfairly. Uh, his uh, second in command, he has repeatedly tried to uh, you know, get out of the office or run with someone else is now benefiting from his downfall. You know, a victory in his mind might just simply be sowing chaos uh, and, you know, doing whatever he can to cause problems for the people he feels has wrong have wronged him. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And the, the, the only thing I'd add um, is, you know, Andrew Cuomo is is sort of addicted to power and wants power at all costs. And so right now, by re-entering the scene, he's already accumulated new power that he didn't really have a, a month, you know, before he made these two recent public appearances and started running these ads because there's people who will now see his threat of running as, as a reason to mollify him, negotiate with him, do various things, uh, you know, pay tribute to him, meet with him, whatever it might be that he's accumulating this power, people are talking about him, people are worried about the threat of him, this is a victory already for him, uh, coming from, you know, six months of, of silence, basically, other than continuing. Well, wasn't silent. Well, okay, <laughs> other, uh, uh, Never yes, went away. No, no, uh, fair, uh, I was gonna say, other than attacking Tish James relentlessly, which is not silence, but, um, but you know, re-entering in the way he has now is, is has accumulated power for him already, which is, you know, his first goal, basically, and I do think he's out for vengeance. Um, just just by the fact that Kathy Hochul holds the office of governor, even though she basically did nothing ever to cross him, other than staying on the ticket, <laughs> um, which is which is something. Uh, I still think he will want to want to take her out, but I don't know that he wants anyone else to be governor besides you know himself. You know, I was just uh, looking at an old poll during the mayoral race, uh, the, the 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 cycle. Um, in 20, so this is mid to late 2020, um, and there were questions asked of voters, whose opinion would matter most to you if they endorsed a particular candidate for mayor? And the members of the Senate were in the 50s, local electeds, 30s, 40s, Andrew Cuomo, 84%. Imagine how, how things have changed. Um, we'll stop here with my questions, but I'll throw it out to anyone um, in our, uh, among our audience, if you, any of you have any questions. Yes, please, and there's a microphone there, if you don't mind. Um, I, I wanna talk to you about um, the budget process. Um, if both the Senate and the Assembly put something in their budget, and I'll give you uh, the example that I wanna use, which is fair pay for home care. Um, what sway does that have with the governor um, in passing? Very little. Uh, Why? Uh, th these these are these are public statements of, of principle, but what really matters is when the negotiations are happening. Whether that is something that they are actually pushing for. More well, uh, technically, um, and check me if I'm getting this wrong. The legislature has very little power through the budget process. It's really interesting. They can delete things from bills put forward with language in them by the governor. They can add money or subtract money from existing line items like reappropriations, mm -hmm. but they can't add new policy into the budget. Um, the governor can do that, but
but the legislature can't. They can only subtract. So they have, it's a structural imbalance that effectively gives them much less power than the governor in the writing of the budget process. Did so, I say that correctly? So you're saying, so even it's, if it's in their each of their budgets, they don't have any say about it? Uh, they can negotiate, like in behind closed doors, Yeah, they, they have sort of threatened to strip all of the policy that she wants to go drinks, all kinds of stuff from the budget. Um, they, they can negotiate it for it. Like if you give us this, we'll give you X. Uh -huh. Um, but they don't. They can't force her hand on it. Just to, to weigh in, um, their budgets they are non-binding resolutions, so they have no actual power. Uh, in those documents, have no power. They're just the legislature's basically uh, list of priorities, response to the executive budget. Um, it is an incredibly uh, unbalanced. Uh, system uh, created at a time when it goes further back than Silver v. Pataki, when uh, a strong, the need for a strong executive, uh, early 1900s, uh, going back to <laughs> Robert Moses, can't have a conversation about politics without bringing him up, uh, to ensure that the budget is done on time, done well, done, you know, uh, with as little deficit as possible. And you know it, it worked uh, for a time when the legislature was not, uh, you know, as well organized. Uh, but nowadays, it means that the governor has almost—I won't say near universal control, but most of the control. And the legislature's main uh, negotiating point, if push comes to shove, is threatening not to vote on a budget and making it late. But they also suffer from that. So. They have leverage in other ways. Certainly there are gonna be backroom negotiations, maybe even negotiations in public, but uh, inclusion in their budget, when again, when push comes to shove, means pr relatively little if the governor's not on board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Yes. So one of you had mentioned that there was uh, no way to understand why crimes were rising because of, I think because of the, the fact that there wasn't really an ethical way, quote unquote, of finding out. I'm assuming because it's like a quasi variable type of situation, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. I think that was me. I, I, I meant that, um, you know, people have a lot of theories about what causes, for example, a spike in in shootings or um, uh, in in burglaries or, or felony assaults as such, but there's so many different things going on, and and there's like this this huge argument that's existed for way longer than the pandemic about things like root causes and proximate causes. I'm sure you guys have studied some of that. Um, is is the spike in crime the result of, of skyrocketing unemployment and like psychological dislocation from the mass death and trauma event that we have all been undergoing? Is it because of, you know, some people will point to there's a few people who have all the guns, the, there's guns coming from, you know, X, Y, and Z state and there's more of them because people bought more of them in the pandemic. Also, we changed all these laws, and, and nobody can say, I mean, people can make their best educated guess, but they can't say with real, they can't say with certainty why, you know, rates of, of different things are happening. That doesn't mean that, that they can't hazard a very good guess, but, but they don't know for certain. That's what I meant by that. And to go back to something I said earlier, which, uh, you know, about the, the, how bad Democrats have been about defending their reforms, you know, you hear people popping up like State Senator Michael Gennaris and others, um, you know, to, to point out that violent crime has spiked across the country where they didn't change their bail laws and, and other things like that. But these arguments are made so sporadically and mostly by the wrong people, uh, you know, not to restate my point, that that the the sort of political conversation is, is, is very different. Um, and you know, this is one of these these issues that even before the reforms were passed in 2019, that um, 
you know, that, that Republican and, and conservatives were, were, were saying, we guarantee this is what it's gonna lead to. And a lot of things, to Laura's point, changed as well, but they were able to point to the fact that violent crime rose over the last couple of years and say, see. Um, and that, that, has, that narrative has not been counteracted very well. And for all the students, we talked about this very issue, correlation versus causation, right? We can't talk about direct cause, but someone looking to capitalize on the strong, cor the, the correlation, maybe not strong, but the correlation is going to use the language and the messaging to their advantage. And so what, what I, to your point actually, one of the strongest voices is one of the, the primary authors, which is Latrice Monique Walker, the assembly member, who spoke to another class that I had, and she was extraordinarily eloquent and strong on what the package of bills, what it was intended to do versus what's actually happening. All these things like the assessment of dangerousness, which was not included, and why wasn't that included? There was some conversation around that. All of the things like desk appearances, how much discretion judges have. Um, all of these pieces, which, and it goes back to this sort of also interesting and important point. What is actually the purpose of bail? The Constitution says it's not supposed to be punitive. It's all, all the only real legal use of it is to make sure that you appear for court. But, so we're attaching all of these other things to it, and the question is, is any of it codified? If it's not, how do we do that? And then how do you, how do you, then, um, how do you then collect data so you can, which we talked about today, evaluate whether or not stuff worked or not? And uh, just, uh, I, I believe it was Todd Kaminsky, uh, who is not running for re-election in the Senate, lost his uh, bid for Nassau County uh, District Attorney because of the bail issue, um, very specifically. Uh, recently, I don't remember who he was talking to, but he had a quote that was basically saying, you know, we have to look at, you know, whether or not bail is working, and it seemed, and it, it is obvious that people don't think it's working, and it's a matter of public perception versus uh, data, and you know, the data is still kind of out. We don't know for sure uh, what kind of impact bail reform has had, uh, but the perception that crime is incredibly high despite recent spikes, it's still be, uh, at historic lows uh, overall compared historically, uh, you know, despite the fact that there is you know, little evidence to suggest that the majority of violent crimes are being committed by people who have been released without bail. Uh, the perception uh, has been outweighing the data because that's what people are afraid of. It plays to their emotions. And it seems that you know, more and more, especially in this issue, that the perception to lawmakers is more important than uh, the actual facts and data because the public might not care about the facts and data if they feel unsafe, uh, and that will cost seats. So uh, this is obviously not true for all lawmakers, but certainly it's, it seems, especially with this issue of bail, that there is a disconnect between the perception and the reality, and lawmakers are you know, potentially legislating based off of the perception rather than you know, taking hard stances based on the reality. Um, we have time for one more question. Oh, we'll take one, we'll take three lightning round questions. So let's, we'll go quickly. Um, <clears throat> the uh, recurring and um, one-time revenues. Uh, the state controller has pointed out for a decade that New York is being shortchanged by Washington by 20, 30 billion dollars a year. This year, for once, we've gotten back what we have put in, but it looks like the legislature has voted to spend, or it looks like the governor's about to spend everything. And I'm wondering whether your editorial boards should be saying, you know, half of that money ought to be set aside because this is not going to be recurring revenue, or urging our congressional delegation to make sure that that fair share continues after 2024 or whenever it is? It's a, it's a good question. It's like spending your tax return money before you get your tax return back. So do, do, is, is, there, is there 
some value in that and saying, look, let's not spend it all. Let's just keep some of it back. Uh, the, 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 yeah, the governor's but go ahead. The governor, the governor's budget was mostly praised as being fairly cautious. She put a bunch of plan, you know, the plan in her executive budget was to put quite a few billion, I don't have the number offhand, in reserves. The state legislature wants to spend more of that. Uh, her budget was 216 billion. They'll probably wind up a bit higher than that in the deal. But then also there's been some new estimates about revenue that have come in higher. So, uh, you know, it is, it is absolutely a discussion that should be had about how much should be in reserves because these flush days are not gonna necessarily continue. But, um, uh, you know, it does seem like they're not gonna be totally irresponsible. Um, hi, so I wanted to ask more about the lack of transparency with the budget process. Um, I remember one of you had mentioned that like the governor has like incomparable power because of a court case. I was wondering if you could speak more about that and also generally why um, even though Cuomo has left the position, like the dynamic of power hasn't shifted. Um, I'll jump in. Um, it's, it, to the, your last question, uh, it's when you have power, you don't want to give it up, and as long as it's enshrined in law or court case or constitution, uh, there's very little uh, to motivate someone to willingly give up control. Uh, in the case of Hochul, uh, we don't necessarily see her being as domineering as Cuomo has b had been uh, in the budget process, but she certainly... Uh, utilizing her position in in the process uh, to the degree that we're able to see because of these transparency issues uh, and to your second point about transparency is just um, it's it's change in Albany is hard <laughs> uh, it can take a very long time and when it comes to uh, especially budget negotiations, we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars, contentious pieces of policy. Um, you know, the deal making that happens is not always pretty. Uh, it's not always, uh, you know, I want to say palatable maybe to the general public. And lawmakers, you know, don't necessarily want their dirty laundry being aired out. And as long as they're behind closed doors, they also still have power, and that's true of the legislative leaders as well. Uh, as long as they are in control of the process, they are able to have more leverage, they're able to have more uh, negotiating tactics. And so even though we've got new people, we've got promise of, promises of transparency, promises of reform, we don't quite see it because the people who would need to implement those reforms stand to lose from said reforms. There's also a bill in the legislature that would uh, move forward a constitutional amendment to shift some of this that the legislature doesn't pass for some reason, uh, and that that's you know a very interesting uh, avenue of exploration perhaps as to why the state legislature wouldn't try to tilt the balance of power in the budget process mo more towards themselves. Hello. Um, I guess you guys both, or the three of you, already mentioned it a bit when you're answering her question, but I was wanting to know, um, in the sense of, like, w I know that what we're talking about is a reality, the conditions of the way things are now, and I know it's hard for it to move. As you guys said, it's things in Albany have been the way they are for a long time, but is there anything that the people can do, or something that can start a movement, a group, or something, to make it a lot less um, private? Like, how is it possible that the lawmakers don't know what's in the budget? You know, like, is there something that can be done to enforce that to be more reviewed? I, I think there's, well, so part of the problem, some people would argue, is a geographic one, that the capital of the state is, what, three and a half hours away from here, and it's um, located in a downtown that is, like, essentially all government buildings, and there's not a natural constituency who can just waltz into, and you can't even waltz into the capital anyway. It's very difficult to get in there ever since the recession of 2008, 2009, actually. Um, so it's, it's physically far away from where people who care are, um, and the people who are making the decisions that affect your lives are very far away. Um, so it's, 
I don't know, they have made some strides in terms of making what business they do do um, available uh, streaming through audio or video, which was like a very recent phenomenon, actually, which is Unless insane. you're the assembly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but being, I think, you just paying attention to the iterative sort of quotidian details of all of these different committees and um, tracking the details and uh, uh, being engaged in a constant way, not just when an election happens. That puts a lot of, that's, I think that's what would be required to make change, but it also puts a, that's a tremendous amount of time and effort from um, you, the, the residents of New York, but it also is you know, I think the politicians are banking on the fact that most people don't have the time to do that. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, you know, these process issues are just very hard to motivate people around. You know, there's busloads of people going to Albany these weeks about a wide variety of issues, but nobody's going really on a bus other than, you know, some good government groups to talk about process or ethics even. Uh, it just doesn't motivate people the same way. But if people put pressure on their legislators to stop passing a budget that you haven't read yet, you know, that could maybe get somewhere, but that's what's needed. And and uh, I won't go into, you know, messages of necessity, but that's something to uh, to talk about in class, you know. And just, uh, it's briefly, I mean, uh, we're, we're seeing a re return of uh, in-person lobbying in Albany for the first time in two years. And, uh, you know, it's even though the process itself is not super transparent, we are seeing more activists and advocates and lobbyists who are up there talking to lawmakers, sharing those closed door discussions that they have, those meetings that they have with lawmakers, sharing this is what they told us, this is what they said. Now, this is not the same as, you know, meetings with leadership who are really in charge of the process, but, you know, it's a step towards greater transparency, uh, social media certainly helps uh, because people are able to share immediately what someone just said to them in a meeting that is not technically a public meeting that's being streamed somewhere. So, you know, just sharing conversations that you've had with lawmakers, any that you have, you know, sharing that information is, you know, one small way that you can hold lawmakers accountable, even if it's not going to necessarily change the entire process or motivate uh, legislators and the governor to decide on a budget uh, a week before it needs to pass so that everyone can read it as opposed to the evening that it's supposed to pass or even the day after it's supposed to pass or later uh, as has historically been the case pre Cuomo uh, and then passed in the dead of night having no one, no one having read the thousands and thousands of eight pages except for maybe the bill drafting commission. And support oh, local news. And support local news and on this campus, you have a very active chapter of NYPIRG, New York Public Interest Research Group. So, you know, get involved. Um, they, they would be more than happy to have you. Um, last thing, because um, I, I always like to do this, and I know I didn't ask this ahead of time, and I'm sorry to, to spring it on you, but any books that you all are reading that you would recommend for us? Um, these are both fiction books. So <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Uh, one is New York 21. Forty. It is uh, a post-apocalyptic, not exactly, it's a post-climate change look at yeah. how New York City is operating from a variety of different perspectives. Um, that includes some, you know, politics in there, which is what drew me to it. Uh, so that's really good by Stanley Kim Robinson uh, and uh, The City We Become by N.K. Jemison, which is uh, basically what if New York City was a living, breathing um, creature manifested through people who represent the boroughs. Um, uh -huh. So it's uh, it's also a very good read. Who's I the Bronx representative? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I don't remember, but it's like... I'm, I'm going to pick it up. I'm I don't gonna remember. Read. I'm going to read it. I just finished reading... You guys might actually think this is really interesting. Um, a book by uh, Rick Perlstein called The Invisible Bridge that's about the years between um, Richard Nixon's resignation and um, the election of, of 
Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan, and it's about sort of the rise of conservatism, but it actually, I, pi I picked it up before um, inflation turned into the thing that it turned into um, <laughs> recently here, but it's super instructive about like what happened when costs of everything rose and people's faith in government and in institutions ebbed to this all-time low and what that did to our politics. And essentially, um, uh, Americans got sick of, uh, or some Americans got sick of hearing about how terrible we were as a country and they decided to buy into um, um, Ronald Reagan, which was really, was really good. It's, it's extremely long though. Uh, I just started, uh, how many New Yorks is it? New York, New York, New York, I think it's called. Uh, I think it's three New Yorks. Um, and I'm gonna get the author's name wrong. because Dija. Dija, yeah, I don't think I've said it out loud. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's tracing sort of the last four, I think, decades of, of New York. It's sort of modern New York City, and it's got some really, I've, I sort of bounced around in my initial looking at it, and now I'm gonna really read it, but... Um, and I've heard him interviewed, uh, and, and might try to interview him once I read the book, but um, it, it seems pretty interesting. Well, listen, thank you so much, Ben, Laura, Rebecca. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank all of you. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.